got my master's science in computer science at the Technica University of Berlin. Um, also collected some research um, yeah, background in automotive systems while I was doing my um, yeah, master's thesis, basically. And since last year, I can call myself conference speaker. So I spoke at the PyData London conference and the EuroPython and some more smaller conferences. And as Amit said, I'm a Hugging Face fellow. So yeah, you might know the company Hugging Face and they've got this fellowship program. And yeah, I don't know how many fellows we are by now. I think about 15 maybe. So yeah, we, we've got some perks. Um, if you're interested, we can talk about it later because now I think we should get started with the presentation first. So a little overview, what awaits you today. Um, we will start uh, with a little from ZIF to AlexNet. So yeah, a little history. Then something about convolution and neural networks, then transformers, multimodality, and the last two points are a bit more hugging face related. Um, as Amit asked me to also include that a bit, as he was also involved in our community computer vision course. So um, yeah, I will show you a bit what that is all about. But now we start with a comic. Actually, it's um, from XKCD. You might have seen it. I learned it's quite famous, actually. Um, so I've seen yeah, it before. yeah, <laughs> it is a pretty good one. It's from 2014, right? And there's like two persons. One is sitting in a laptop or like a computer, and one is standing behind. And the person standing says, "When a user takes a photo, the app should check whether they are in a national park." And the uh, uh, computer person says, "Sure, easy GIS look up. Give me a few hours." And then the person standing says, and check whether the photo is of a bird. And the person at the computer says, I will need a research team and five years. Uh, and the caption reads, in computer science, it can be hard to explain the difference between the easy and the virtually impossible, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in 2014, uh, apparently it was quite hard to yeah, classify a photo, whether it's of a bird, and it was quite easy to just run a GIS lookup, right? So now it's 2024, all right? And at the beginning of the year, there was a new product released, which really caught my attention. And uh, I don't want to advertise it here, but you know, <laughs> it's quite cool. And just to make a point, uh, how far we've come, these are binoculars, right? They're like from Swarovski Optic, the AX visual thing. Um, and yeah, they don't have diamonds, even though it's Swarovski. Um, you know, they're really cool because you can take photos and videos and directly share them via the app and everything. So it's like smart device, right? But what's really, really cool is that you actually can classify up to 9,000 animals with the push of a button on it, right? So it's amazing. You can just like, yeah, look, uh, look at the animal and then push the button. It will take a photo and it will tell you, ah, this is a rabbit. OK, probably you know what a rabbit is. But <laughs> you know, if you're not sure what's that animal I'm looking at, and it will just tell you in the binoculars. Um, so that's pretty crazy. And I thought, like, OK, we, we, you know, we were here in 2014, um, but it was virtually impossible to classify the image of a bird. And now we are in 2024, and we've got that stuff in binoculars, you know, and it can tell you like 9,000 animals. So how did we get there, right? Um, so I thought about, OK, what, what is like the old way of computer vision to classify an image of a bird, for example? So this bird here, um, you will meet it a few more times in the presentation. It's, it's a Kia. It is native to the southern island of New Zealand. It's a parrot that lives in the um, Alpine regions. And it's actually one of my favorite birds, right? So I thought, OK, let's take that one. And let's think about how do we classify that, right, with old computer vision. So in the old times, we would go collect a lot of images of keyers, for example. And then we do key point detection. So right, for example, SIFT, uh, like the scale invariant feature transform, that's a cool name. It's one of the really popular methods for that. It will just give us a lot of points that might be interesting and that might be helpful in classifying images. So then we do a clustering on these key points. So we don't have like a thousand of them, but just like, I don't know, 20 cluster centers or something. And with these cluster centers, we can then create a feature vector and feed that to a machine learning method like a support vector machine, All right? That works. Okay-ish, I would say. <laughs> 
So as always, it depends on your data, mm -hmm, stuff like that. Um, the good thing is you can properly implement it in less than 100 lines of code, and it doesn't train that long. But yeah, the performance is OK-ish. So I thought, what other ways are there in, in the old computer vision? And I will introduce one more method that are hard cascades. They're more for object detection, right? And they're most famous, actually, for being able to detect faces. So they were released by um, Biola and Jones in 2001. So that's already 23 years ago now. <laughs> and they're still used in some cases. And the idea is that you have some handcrafted features, basically, you see over here. And then you have a fixed window, like here. And um, yeah, then you basically slide the window over an image, and you try to find good places for these features. Um, yeah, these features and place them in the window such that you get a maximum score, right? So here, for example, when you have dark areas, you get a high score, and when you have white uh, or light areas here, you get a high score, right? So when that's a dark area and that's a light area, you get a high score. Usually, eyes and below are good for this filter, or like here, right? Dark eyes and in between it's lighter. Um, how that looks. In practice, you can see here is a nice little video. Um, actually, the best I found. So you can see there's this window. It's just sliding over, and it's then matching these features in there, right? And it's just and that's how it goes over the whole image. Actually, it's quite fast. It's just a bit slower here because uh, yeah, visualization stuff. So in the end, you have some some candidates here, and then. You do like an, another round with a bigger window, and then you get some more candidates. And in the end, yeah, you have a lot of candidates, and then you just have to f figure out which are the best and which are overlapping, and yeah, what you say. OK, so that works as well, right? But there are problems. Oh, wait a second. Right. <laughs> um, so there are problems with hard cascades, key point detectors the old ways of computer vision, you know? And the three main problems are seen here. Bunnies, no, <laughs> not the bunnies, but uh, generalization, flexibility, and robustness. So yeah, there's one story I always like to tell about robustness that comes from my research days in an automotive um, area, where I basically had the task to classify in a driveway whether a car was approaching or was just a pedestrian or something, right? So I was like, yeah, maybe I can use hard cascades for that. So I tried to train a hard cascade classifier that was just looking at this driveway, right? This camera, it was just taking pictures. And I thought, okay, easy enough. Fix setting, just detect whether it's a car. But it was really, really hard because of changing weather conditions, right? So the robustness of hard cascades is terrible. <laughs> Basically, I would have to train own classifiers for cars uh, in rainy weather, cars uh, in darkness, cars when it's uh, light outside. Um, in the end, yeah, it's just lacking a lot of all these. You know, it, it's just not really good at generalization. It, it's not flexible. You, you can't easily reuse it to train other stuff. So we needed something else, right? And this something else came in 2012, the big moment that um, I guess most people know about. Uh, I call it the revolution, AlexNet, right? Da, da, da. Image net classification with deep convolutional neural networks by Alex Krzyzewski, Ilya Satskiver, and Geoffrey Hinton. OK, so I mean, the last two names are still quite well known, I would say, right? Ilya, who said OpenAI, and Geoffrey Hinton, one of the big names. Um, but yeah. The neural network in the end uh, bears the name of Alex, the first author of the paper. And yeah, it was so special, AlexNet, because it was just able to yeah, blow other methods out of the water um, on the ImageNet classification challenge, as it says here, right? ImageNet classification. So it was more than 10% better than the other methods before. And yeah, the years before it was always like, yeah, maybe the best method was 1%, 2% better. And then AlexNet came and just crushed it. Um, but AlexNet was not the first convolutional neural network. 
right? And because I'm a sucker for history, um, <laughs> I drew this little timeline here. Um, so here you can see, like in, in 19, uh, 1979, it actually already began with a Ni Koch neutron, which is oh, which can be considered the, the grandfather of all convolutional neural networks, right? Um, and in 1989, we had the first Linet, Linet one by Jan Lequin, which you might also know, um, as he's quite a prominent voice, right, from Meta at the moment. And yeah, in 1994, we had the convolutional dynamic systems, which introduced back propagation. And that was a really crucial step to yeah, get things to work the way we are used to today. Um, and in 1998, Jan Licker improved his Linet, so he had a Linet 5 version. And then in 2012, we had our AlexNet, right? OK, that's a, the really, really short history up to AlexNet. Um, if you're interested more in any of these, um, look it up. It's quite interesting, at least for me. <laughs> As I said, I'm really interested in the history. OK, but now you might wonder, OK, convolutional networks, what is that actually? Right? So I've got this little animation. It runs a little fast, but I will try to explain a bit here. Okay, so you've got your base image, which is this rectangle right here, and you've got a sliding window going over it, right? You just saw it. Um, so a bit like you saw in the hard cascades. But here, this sliding window is called a kernel. And this kernel um, basically produces a new value for every step where it stops, right? So Every time it stops, it just creates a new value. And then in the end, you have yeah, a matrix. And we call it feature maps, actually, right here. And then you have different kernels that go over it. In this case, it would be three different kernels. Um, so you get three feature maps. And then yeah, that's the convolutional part, really. That's what we call convolutions, when we move kernels over images. And yeah, then we go, go on. and. I analyze these feature maps with the kernel again or with new kernels and we get other feature maps. They tend to get a bit smaller with size, uh, with length. And in the end, we have fully connected layers, which are then used for the classification task, right? So usually the output in the end is um, as many values as you have classes. So when you have like 10 classes in your data, then you have 10 outputs in the end. Okay. that's convolutional neural networks in a nutshell. So let's have a look at them in action, or like the Linet 5, right, which was in 1998, which was already pretty good and which had a lot of building blocks that we still see today. So we have our first image here, which is like 32 times 32 pixels, and then we have convolution, and we have the feature maps, right? There are six feature maps. So that means there were like six kernels that analyzed the image. And then um, Jan Lecker added subsampling. So that just yeah, downsizes basically these feature maps. Instead of 28 times 28 pixels, it's then 14 times 40. Then we do convolutions again. Then we have like 16 feature maps. And we do subsampling again. And then we have fully connected layers. So there was Linet in 1998. Now AlexNet was a little bit different. Um, I, I try to not show too many architecture uh, graphics here, but I think it's quite cool to to understand like okay what changed in AlexNet, and um, yeah, here you might say, hey Johannes, your your graphic is cut off at the top, but actually it's the real original diagram you find in the paper. So um, I was quite surprised as well that like one of the most influential papers has a cut off diagram, but yeah, <laughs> we can live with that, right? Because actually AlexNet has two networks that run in parallel on two GPUs, right? Because in the time in 2012, the GPU, GPUs weren't that powerful. So we have one network down here and one up here, which are basically the same and just sometimes communicate with each other, like in this layer or uh, in the end, right? But that was actually one of the, the main successful building blocks that it uh, yeah, used two GPUs to train. And it has way more feature maps, actually. So these numbers always are the feature maps, right? So you saw in the first layer in the net, it was six. And in AlexNet, it's already 48 in the first layer. And then they go to 128, 192, stuff like that. 
yeah, they also do sub sampling, or they call it max pooling here. That's what we still call it today, right? Um, yeah, and AlexNet had some other introductions, like they replaced the activation function. So before it was sigmoid, then they used the uh, rectified linear units, the ReLU. Um, yeah, there's some stuff. I won't go into detail. If you're more interested in AlexNet, you can look it up. There are a lot of great blog posts about that. OK. Um, maybe just a word about the kernels again, right? So in this image here, you see what AlexNet learned, like the first 96 convolutional kernels, right? So from this first layer, you have 48 and 48 here. So 2 times 48 is 96. So these are the kernels it learned, right? And it's quite interesting when you compare it to something like hard cascades. I mean, they're really simple, right? <laughs> Basically handcrafted in hard cascades. And here in convolution and neural networks, they are learned and they are way more complex, right? So it's, it's a huge step forward, basically. And yeah, uh, no wonder it's better than Harkas Cates or yeah, key point detectors, right? So back to our task, right? We had a bird image, and we want to find out if the image is of a bird. So we've got our key image here. Um, I ran it in a, in a demo on Hugging Face Spaces, right? So I found a demo of AlexNet, uh, trained with ImageNet. And then I put it in and said, OK, what is that? And it says it is a kite. Well, <laughs> our bird is uh, not, not a kite, really. Um, well, at least you can say the other ones here actually are birds. So I looked up uh, ptarmigan, because I didn't know that uh, it's a kind of bird. And the others are too. But yeah, that it thinks it's a kite is, of course, not great, right? So what else can we do? Um, well. We can scale, right? So we need to go deeper. Um, and we went it deeper a lot. So I've got a timeline again. <laughs> you can see it here. And yeah, so after AlexNet, basically the race was on for more successful models, right? So a lot of researchers started to look into that. Um, suddenly, neural networks, convolutional neural networks, they were the hot topic. And everyone was like, OK, let's build, let's build. Uh, one of the first successful ones was the Google Net, which was later called Inception V1, right? And then had like other Inception V3, 2, 4 versions uh, in 2014. And also 2014 is uh, the VGG model. Then 2015, ResNet, which really went deeper. So <laughs> ResNet was really, I think in the version 2, you can go to 150 layers or something. So compared to AlexNet and Linet, of course, it's like a huge scaling. Um, yeah. In 2017, we had MobileNet, which went a bit a different way because it wanted to actually yeah, make it accessible for smaller devices, right? It was a mobile, mobile devices, basically. And that's really nice as well. And then in 2019, there's EfficientNet, which is a family of different convolutional networks. Um, Basically, depending on, on your needs, you can choose one of the efficient nets. They're small, they're big, whatever you have. If you have many resources, you can just use the bigger networks, have better accuracy. If you have smaller resources, like on mobile, you can use the smaller ones. And yeah, kind of most recently in 2022, there was Confnext, right? So these are just some models. So there are so many models in that time release that they would never fit on one timeline altogether. Um, but this might be, an, yeah, just inspiration of some of the most important ones, right? So now you might wonder which one is the best. Actually, <laughs> that that's always a good question. Which one is best? Um, and I found this cool new feature on Papers with Code, right? Here you can see Papers with Code, um, where you can actually now see the proportion of papers uh, quarterly. Um, where the different networks were mentioned, right? So you've got like this graph from I think it's 2017 where it starts, and it goes all the way to to now. And you can see that by far, ResNet have been the most popular among these at least, right? ResNet, VGG, DenseNet, uh, VGG16, MobileNet, AlexNet. But I was also quite surprised to still see AlexNet going strong in 2017 and 2018. Right, because AlexNet is like 
for today's standards, a really, really basic network. Um, yeah, regarding questions from the chat, um, I think we will uh, just answer it later, maybe right in the Q&A at the end of the session. That's correct. Yeah, OK. So we just collect all the questions, and then in the end, we, we go through them, right? Yes. OK, cool. OK, so now that we know, OK, ResNet is really popular, let's try that, right? We've got our Kia. We've got a, a ResNet demo space with ImageNet trained, and we feed it. So now it says it's a hen. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's OK. <laughs> At least the hen is a bird, right? Um, I mean, apparently, our problem is that the ImageNet data set does not have the Kia or even Parrot as one class, right? Um, it has some parrots in there, so some species of parrots, but not the Kia and not the parrots in general. Um, so it is already good that it now can say us it's actually a kind of bird and not a kite anymore. <laughs> yeah, that helps, I guess, right? So ResNet already an improvement to AlexNet. We can um, record that. And now, of course, there are way more CNNs, and um, they can be applied to way more than just classification, right? So what I listed here are basically the three fundamental tasks, I would say. There are more tasks, of course, in computer vision, but a lot can be, well, just, um, yeah, be related to these ones. So as a classification, as we saw, right? And there's detection, just saying like, okay, there is the bird in the image. And then there is segmentation, where we actually want to really annotate the pixels in the image and say, okay, that's the bird. And sometimes in segmentation, we have like the, the whole image is segmented. So we have to say, okay, there's forest in the background, there's a road here, and then there's a bird there. Yeah, you can also see it failed to actually segment the, uh, the feet because I think the feet are quite hard um, to segment. But yeah, mm, that's, yeah. It's three fundamental tasks, really. And there are all kinds of different networks. As I said, there's just a small collection here to give you an impression, right? Uh, probably you heard some of those names, like for classification already, some I mentioned, like the VGT, ResNet, EfficientNet, MobileNet, ConfNext. For detection, there is faster RCNN. Uh, YOLO, of course, <laughs> I think YOLO is still one of the most uh, popular detection frameworks by now, right? I think we were at YOLO v9. It feels like every few months there's a new YOLO version coming out at the moment. And there's single shot detectors as well, and RetinaNet, for example. For segmentation, there are also some different ones. There's like the, the FCNs, um, which I experimented with quite a bit when I was doing research. And there's Mask, RCNN, uh, DeepLab, and UNET. Yeah. I mean, these days, units are mostly used for generative purposes, I guess. But um, they also can be used for segmentation. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's an original idea. OK. So you can pick one if you just want to do any of these tasks, right? And of course, which domains can be used for CNNs, right? And it's it's a bit like every domain. So it's I can't really think of, of a domain where you can't use a CNN because there are so many different kinds, of course, right? So at the top, I wrote autonomous vehicle, vehicles because I researched in that. Medical imaging, manufacturing, and industrial automation is actually quite interesting because you can do it for like quality control and stuff like that. So when something is manufactured automatically and you can check whether it's broken or has some minor problems, um, multimedia content analysis, retail and, retail and e-commerce, final and financial services, um, all kinds of stuff, and uh, augmented and virtual reality. And over here, I wrote text mining and natural language processing. So that might be the most surprising because these days when we think of natural language processing, we don't think of CNNs, right? Um, so we are here in the computer vision presentation, but I shortly want to talk about natural language processing, okay? So what is natural language processing or NLP? By definition from deep learning AI, it is the discipline of building machines that can manipulate human language or data that resembles human language in the way that it is written, spoken, and organized. 
Okay, so that's short NLP definition. So why does it matter? Because of transformers, of course. <laughs> I guess most people know about transformers. Um, and probably you know the paper that started it all, right? That's like the attention is all you need in 2017. Um, yeah, a real landmark paper. And there were more papers, right? Like BERT and the original GPT paper from OpenAI, um, T5 paper, or the Roberta paper, right? That was all the stuff that was happening in, in natural language processing beginning in 2017. And before, you know, it always felt for me as someone who mainly dealt with computer vision, oh yeah, well, natural language processing, they've got their recurrent neural networks and stuff. Yeah, it, it somehow works, but it's not that great. You know, it's, it's not worth looking into for computer vision. But, well, something was brewing, right? And <laughs> so at some point, uh, computer vision people were like, okay, what the hell they're doing over there actually, right? So what, what what's happening there? What, what are these transformers? What is that and how can we maybe use that? And there were different approaches. Okay, I know, first I wanted to look into the main, or like one of the main concepts, right? The self-attention, um, just really shortly, because I think to understand why transformers were so special and um, why they worked, it is important to know at least the basics of self-attention. So this is a mechanism quite different to convolutions, right? So for example, here, when you have a sentence like, I like Kia parrots, uh, and that's me, I like Kia parrots. Um, so you basically can turn these into four tokens, what we call these squares for now, tokens. And each token gets three vectors, a query vector, a key vector, and a value vector. And then what attention does is that it can create dependencies, right? Um, if you want, we can talk about self-attention later more. For now, as I said, just a really rough overview. So for example, from, from the Kia token, we can then you know, we basically take the query vector and we multiply it with the key vectors of the other tokens. And then uh, we do some more number magic. And in the end, we do get an attention value. We can call it Z3. And we do actually get attention values for every of these tokens. And all the attention values now have like dependencies to other tokens, right? And, and they can help us understand the relations between the tokens some more. OK, just the, the basic intuition. Um, so. The thing that then got transformers started in computer vision was really the vision transformer, which is uh, quite a simple name because it says what it does, right? It's a transformer for vision. Um, released actually in late 2020, then at the ICLR conference in 2021. And let's have a quick look what it does, right? So again, we get our key or parrot here and we slice it up, right? Without harming the parrot, of course, uh, which gets us. 16 patches of images, for example, here. OK, so these are now yeah, our images. Uh, our image turned into patches. Then we feed those to a linear projection layer, right? So it's basically turning them into tokens. Um, now there are numbers, we can say. And we add a class token in the beginning. OK, this class token is important. Uh, to remember, because then we feed all of these tokens into our transformer encoder, where a lot of self-attention magic happens. So basically, we find out how all these patches relate to one another. And in the end, we have a multi-layer perceptron hat um, that we use to analyze our class token, right? Because the class token, in the end, actually learns from the other tokens which class it should well, classify, right? So in the end, hopefully, when we put in a key a parrot, it will tell us, oh, this class is a parrot, right, for example. OK, does it work? Let's see. There's a demo of a vision transformer trained on ImageNet. Um, again, our key a parrot, and it says lorikeet. OK, <laughs> what's a lorikeet, right? It is a kind of parrot. I looked it up. Um, now, the problem here, you think, OK, but is there something wrong? 
is the low percentages, right? So I think the person that created the demo just somehow messed up uh, the last layer and all that stuff. Um, and yeah, so we can trust that Lori Keat probably is, is, is the best value, even though it's just 6% here, uh, I guess it should be more, but there was something wrong in analyzing in the end. So that's a great step forward, right? So finally, we are able to actually say, okay, that is a parrot. Yeah, even though it's a lorry key, but yeah, as I said, there's no key parrot in ImageNet, so good enough, right? And you can also see it here again, uh, papers with code, right? Um, so I, I look for vision transformer and you see the blue line, that's the vision transformer and it starts here, release. And then it does surpass ResNet even in the beginning of 2022. And now it's, yeah, it's above ResNet, right? So ResNet is not completely out of the game, um, but Vision Transformers just crossed the line. Okay, and oh, here, see, um, that should be Transformers for everyone and not CNNs for everyone. <laughs> um, sorry for that. <clears throat> but of course, there are all kinds of different Transformers um, also for classification, right? There's WIT, there's SWIN, which is a really popular one, uh, DATE and MASK autoencoders which make it more efficient, mostly on, on smaller data sets as well. Dino, the unsupervised version. And for detection there, um, above all is Detter, uh, the really popular one, Mask, Dino, Yolos, deformable Detter. And for segmentation, we've got SegFormer, MaskFormer, and SAM. Okay, I think I have to hurry up a bit because uh, I don't want to run out of time. And yeah, again, here's a little well, graph where you see, okay, among some of the transformers, Vision Transformer is the most popular by far. Swin Transformer is doing pretty well as well. Dino also has risen a bit. Um, yeah. Okay, so now you might wonder, okay, convolutional networks and transformers, which one is better? So let's compare it, right? Because that's a question I often see, like what, what should I use, right? What's better? And it's hard to say, of course, and it always depends. <laughs> But I, I try to collect some arguments for one and for the other, um, so you can figure out yourself uh, which one you would rather like. And of course, all these things are always up for discussion and as research goes on, it changes. But yeah, for now, let's start, all right? So convolutional neural networks have parameter efficiency on their side. So they tend to be more efficient with fewer parameters as the, in comparison to transformers. Um, transformers on their side have the interpretability uh, because through the attention, it's actually easier to interpret the results and the activations. I mean, there are a lot of methods that also do that for CNNs. Um, yeah, it's just simpler for transformers, right? So you can do the CNNs the interpretability, but yeah, just putting it there. Um, one of the biggest differences probably are the receptive fields, right? So CNNs have quite local receptive fields. We saw those windows sliding over uh, over the images, right? And yeah, so they're quite small and they have like a real, well, detailed focus, I would say. While transformers are more global, right? So you, because of the self-attention, you have like yeah, relations among image patches over the whole image. But then again, you usually don't have very small image patches because that tends to be really computational inefficient when you have more patches, you have to compute more self-attention, right? So you can't like, yeah, really split it down um, as small as in CNNs. Okay, uh, next one, CNNs tend to have a better training time. Of course, on transformer side, there's a lot of stuff. Well, it always depends, right? which transformers you use and which methods you use. Uh, but in general, I think we can say, okay, CNNs have shorter training time. Now, on transformer side, there's few shot adaption. Um, now that's the point <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, the least sure about, <laughs> but I put it here anyway, um, because I read some stuff about it and was like, oh, okay. Um, so it says that transformers when retrained 
are better at adapting to tasks with fewer examples, right? So basically that you can do fine tuning with fewer examples. Um, I take it for now, right? That's it. And uh, last points actually. So CNNs, you should never forget, they are really adopted in the industry. So they are, well, in a lot of things already implemented. Um, yeah, they are basically everywhere. They really do computer vision on a big scale, I would say. But the big promise of transformers and um, one that I find quite important is the multimodality, right? Because we are using transformers for different things like natural language processing. We use it for audio processing. We now use it for computer vision. We can also easily easier build um, architectures that take into account, yeah, different modalities. And that's actually our next point, right? Multimodality or vision language adventures I put here. Okay, so just a really quick run through multimodality and it all starts with CLIP, right? The Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training, which is a model released by OpenAI. Um, and as usual with OpenAI, we are not really sure about the training da data they had and about the exact architecture, but they did release some stuff more than for their latest models, I would say. So we know what they did is that they had a bunch of images and a bunch of captions for these images, right? Like here, Pepper, the Aussie pup, and then there are two encoders, so a text encoder and an image encoder, which created embeddings of images and text. And then they try to contrastively align these image and text embeddings so that in the end, you could take a label, uh, so a label set like here, like playing car dog, and just create a sentence like a photo of a dog. Put that in text encoder, then you get like a photo of a dog an image encoder and it will tell you ah it's probably a photo of the dog right um yeah so how does that work in uh, practice again there's a demo there's our kia parrot so now we have to put in a list of labels right so that's it's like the downside you have to know what you're looking for and i put in parrot kite and coconut right so let's see what it says, clip says it's a parrot, 100%. Here's another one, <laughs> it's the clip. Um, it is a variation of clip, you could say. It says 7% parrot. Um, again, I think there's something wrong with like the, the processing of the outputs in the end. But that's pretty good, right? It now can tell us 100% it's a parrot and not a kite, which in the beginning with AlexNet was still quite hard. Um, now, another interesting multimodal uh, model is OWLVIT or OWLV2 as well. All right, so they basically build up on CLIP, right? So you have text encoder and vision encoder. You can just use CLIP for both of these actually. And then you add two heads to the vision encoder. One is for classification and the other one is for creating bounding boxes, right? So Again, you can just put in any any words you want, any classes we want, and it will give you bounding boxes in the image, actually. So again, how does it work? We put in two things here, a parrot and a kite, for example, right? And you click submit, and it tells us it's a parrot. Worked pretty well, All right? So that already shows like what multimodality is really good at, what all these vision language models are really good at, is zero shot uh, performance, right? Zero shot classification, zero shot detection. So stuff it maybe has never seen in the whole data set or was not trained for. Like, I, I don't know if it ever saw a parrot in, in the data set. I don't know if it ever saw a kite in the data set, I don't, right? But it, it somehow learns um, a lot more by combining vision and language actually. But of course the problem is we know what that we have to know what to look for, right? So there's one more model I want to talk about in multimodality, and that is Cosmos 2. So Cosmos 2 is a grounded um, MLLM, they say, right? Multimodal large language model, basically. And Cosmos 2 is interesting because you can ask it questions about 
an image and say like, okay, this one here, this thing, where is it? And it will tell you in a microwave oven. Or you are driving this car and you mark the car and then to pick up that man, you mark that man. And then you say, you need to, and the model says, go through the intersection and turn right. And so it, yeah, that's ground its whole reasoning in the image actually. And that's pretty cool because it can also do captioning, right? So that's what I did here. So I said, okay, here's an image of my parrot, um, do a captioning on that, a detailed captioning. And it was able to tell me it's a Kia parrot, stands on a road with its beak open. And that was pretty great because now I finally have something that can tell me it's a Kia parrot. Um, yeah, so my problem finally is solved. <laughs> okay, so we can say vision transformers and large language models might be the future, right? But then again, the future has a lot of papers that's <laughs> an analysis. Um, and that's just 2021, right? You see the increase in papers per month in ML and AI. And that was even before ChatGPT and everything. So it, it's, it's crazy, right? It, it went this far up. So here's the log scale actually. So we've got like this, yeah, this crazy crows. And I think it just went crazier after ChatGPT, right? So uh, how can you keep up with that? You might wonder, that, that's a question I always ask myself, how should I keep up with all this research, right? And that's how I imagine it. the research just piled up on the beach, um, just a lot of papers, and then the wind comes. And maybe I just catch whatever the wind blows to me, right? And if I'm lucky, I get something like the RTMs. Probably you remember that, the retention networks. A few months ago, they really sparked interest. Or JEPA, which is also really interesting. Or maybe Mamba, which is, of course, maybe the most trending architecture right now in the whole Mamba stuff. Right, but it's hard to tell beforehand what might be reasonable because sometimes there are trending papers like capsule networks. Who remembers that? I don't know. A few years ago, they were the thing. Oh yeah, capsule networks. They might might work, but they were just forgotten again and landed on the ground. Basically, same for generative flow networks. It's it's hard to tell, right? Only only time can tell, really. Um, okay, so yeah, my recommendation is usually wait a bit <laughs> uh, and see whatever catches on, right? So if you can afford it, of course, if you work in research, you have to keep your eyes on, on like the trending papers. Um, but in general, yeah, listening to, to social media channels and stuff like that, seeing what, what goes trending is quite a good way to figure out what might be interesting. So you don't have to read through 100 papers each day. Okay. That's it for this part. Now I quickly go to the hugging face part, right? Because that's what Amit is a lot interested yes. in. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you probably know hugging face and you might mostly know it for, for natural language processing. But by now, you know, hugging face also loves computer vision, right? So there are a lot of tasks. So there's this task page and there's stuff like depth estimation, all these tasks, um, also two multimodal tasks at the moment. Uh, actually, you can also contribute. If you say, like, hey, I'm, I'm working on this great task, it's uh, maybe a bit special, um, but I want to have it here because there are some models on the hub, then you can just contribute to it, right? I, I added the link here. I don't know, probably you have the slides afterwards somewhere and you can also contribute to these tasks pages. And yeah, if you have a task that is near to your heart, just make a contribution. Um, and there are the hugging face pipelines for computer vision, which are also great because they're really sim simple and you can easily use them. Um, so there's stuff like depth estimation, image classification, object detection, also zero shot object detection, right? And zero shot image classification. I think this one uses all of it by, by default and this one probably clip. Um, yeah. yeah, and just quickly how you can use it Right, it's just really simple. Like here, depth estimation pipeline from the transformers library. You import pipeline. You say depth estimator um, initialize the pipeline with the right task, like depth estimation. Then you can uh, uh, say which model you want to use, or just leave it blank. If you just leave it blank, if you use the default model, and just throw in some image 
image URL or pillow image, whatever you want, and it will give you the output, and then you can work with the output. So actually using <laughs> computer vision with Hugging Face is pretty simple, is what I just want to point out here, right? Um, but there's one thing, you know, that always was a bit of a problem. So maybe you know this page on Hugging Face, it's all the courses they have. There's a natural language processing course, it's a deep reinforcement learning course, it's an audio course. There's the open source AI cookbook, there's ML for games course. Pretty cool, right? But what is missing? Of course, the computer vision course, right? So yeah, um, I also thought it was missing and there were a lot of questions from com community. Okay, when do we get a computer vision course? Uh, why don't we have one yet? And then I thought, okay, why not just start one with the community, right? So that's what we did on Discord. We started the community computer vision course. All right, and that's our timeline basically. Um, so it started in October, 2023 and we started by creating a syllabus, uh, set up the repository, break down the chapters, form teams. Then in December of last year, we had a sprint, right? It's, it's where we created a lot of content. I think like 90% of the content, okay, maybe 80% of the content um, that's in the course right now was created in December. And um, then we entered the phase we are still in, which is kind of refining content, uh, fixing style, integrated with Hugging Face, and yeah, get ready for publishing, which hopefully will still happen in this month, but we will see, right? Um, so yeah, here are some statistics about the course because that's also pretty cool to see, right? So there's a repository. Right now we have a bit over 200 stars actually. We had more than 80 participants. It's actually quite hard to estimate the number correctly, but I would say at least 80 participants over the whole time period, because some people, they joined in the beginning, they dropped out in between, some people joined somewhere in between. Yeah, whatever. Um, and then there, are, there were 2,235 commits to the main branch, or that made it into the main branch, basically. Um, we have 13 chapters in total with 81 markdown files and 30 notebooks. And in total, 183 merged pull requests in the repository, right? So that's some numbers. That's pretty cool. And those are the chapters we have, right? Uh, fundamentals, convolution and networks, vision transformers, multimodal models, basic CV task, video and video processing, um, a lot of stuff I talked about, some stuff I didn't talk about, like generative models and 3D vision. Um, yeah, but time is short, right? Even now we're running out of time. So uh, <laughs> I had to prioritize a bit. Um, but if you're interested, hopefully you can soon have a look in the course. And actually, I will give you a little sneak peek of the course right now. Okay, you're ready? So it will kind of look something like this. Okay, so over here we have like all our content. We've got like welcome to the community computer vision course. Um, there also is an assignment here so that you can get a certificate in the end, right? Because that's always cool if you just go through the course and then you complete the assignment and you get your certificate and then you can say like, hey, I completed, completed the community computer vision course uh, of Hugging Face. Um, and yeah, we've got fundamentals in the beginning, which is really interesting. We've got some philosophical questions about vision and images, um, but also stuff like feature description and matching. Then yeah, convolution neural networks, as I said, quite a lot of stuff in here. Vision transformers, broadly covered. Multimodal models, um, also with Owlbit, for example, and Clip, of course. And generative models, we try to keep it short on generative models because there is a course on generative models and hugging face already. And yeah, there's some units that still lack a bit of content, I would say, like in the basic CV tasks, right? We only have object detection and image segmentation for video and video processing. Um, it's not that much yet, but I mean, the course is not closed, right? So if you feel like, hey, I want to contribute as well, then you can just 
hop into Discord, hugging face, or just go to the repository, open an issue, and say, hey, I want to write about this or that. Um, and yeah, create a pull request, and you can contribute. Yeah. Yeah, and one, thing I, that, wanna, one yeah. thing I want to add is I had a chance to uh, work with Johannes and the rest of the community on this course, and it was very exciting, actually. <laughs> so uh, I would um, advise as well, if there's something you want to add, go ahead and join in. We'll welcome you with open arms, because <laughs> uh, very exciting uh, working on this community course with, with, uh, with everyone. So I, I would highly advise you to join if you want to add something. Yes, definitely. That's, that's true. OK, so yeah, with that being said, um, I think we can go. OK, I just add this again, because it was like the last slide. Thank you. The key is coming again. And you can do Q&A really shortly, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> well, we can go ahead and start it now, uh, Johannes. So let's see. Uh, we had a couple of questions. Uh, the first question that came in was from, um, uh, let's see here, was from uh, Abbas. Abbas was curious uh, whether ResNet is popular because it's simple to implement, or is there a performance benefit to using ResNet? Yeah, I think one of the benefits is that it comes in, in different sizes, right? So you can, there are like ResNet 50, there's ResNet 100, 151, or no, 150, 101. Um, yeah, so I think that's what makes it quite popular is that it can be also used for different use cases and it has quite a good performance um, for the size. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the main points really. And it's, it, implemented quite a lot and easily to get hold of you know you can easily just load the model from anywhere and yeah it's even a transformers library actually so <laughs> that's that's funny about the transformers library these days right there's not only transformers in the transformers library so <laughs> you can also use the transformers library to use resnet to use efficient net um confnext so a lot of convolutional networks are actually included in the transformers library these days mm -hmm. Okay, uh, while I'm looking through uh, the rest of the questions here, uh, if anyone else has a question in the meantime, you can go ahead and take yourself off mute and you can ask the question directly. Yeah, maybe Shubanka who raised his hand. Hi, Johannes, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, recently, I've been like watching lectures, but I used to sleep, but this was uh, honestly a great talk. So I was like 100% attentive, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And uh, so what I want to ask is, is there a way to be involved in the community? Uh, like uh, there was a section under the October 2023 to where the teams were formed to actually develop the course or contribute to the course. Yeah, it's just uh, basically you can jump on the Discord and the Hugging Face Discord. Um, I think I have not included a link to that, actually. And there we've got our CV community project channel. Um, then you can still join it, right? It's uh, it's still open, as I mentioned in the end. So uh, yeah, everyone is welcome to still join our CV community on on the Hugging Face Discord and yeah, participate. So okay. I, I have to say, right now in the course, we are trying to just get it released. So we might not be quickly um, just yeah adding new content for the next few weeks, right? Because we just want to get to release of the first version. But surely in, in the near future, we will actually also add new stuff and yeah. OK, thank you so much. Uh, I'll surely look into that. And you were asking that, uh, sorry, I just, just have a second part question, that how to become more uh, like hugging face, hugging face fellow. So if you can speak about it now, or I can definitely connect later too. Yeah, actually, it's a question I, I get quite a lot in uh, the recent times. Um, and I think there's no one path to that, right? For, for me, it was mainly because I was uh, visible on, on the Discord channel and the community, you know, but you can also uh, be visible in, in some other ways, right? Maybe you create a lot of PRs to the Hugging Face um, libraries. Maybe you do a lot for documentation. So I think the, the main ingredient is to to be visible to the hugging face people um, in, in some way, in some consistent way as well, right? So I did for, for a few months, I did work in the computer vision community. And then I got the invitation, hey, do you want to be a fellow, right? So it's like, yeah, just find your way um, that suits you to maybe 
yeah, help the community, the Hugging Face community in some way, or improve the libraries and do that for some time. And then, yeah, mostly you will get seen by, by the Hugging Face people. And, and from time to time in our fellows channels, or we've got our Slack channel, um, there are new people introduced. Sometimes you get asked like, hey, do you know someone? And if we have the feeling that someone from the community has done a lot, you can also like propose to get them to the Hugging Face Fellows status. Yeah. That's awesome. Surely, surely I would I would get into that. Is there any perks like that you want to share about being a Hugging Face Fellow? That That's my last question, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the perks well, I already mentioned the the Slack channel. So we do have a Slack channel which is integrated into the Hugging Face com company Slack, basically. So we can easily contact people from Hugging Face, right? We don't have to uh, write into forums or whatever when we have questions. Um, we also get invited to like beta testing some some things. Sometimes they tell us, "Hey, we've got this new thing going on here. Do you want to test it?" Um, and of course, we get some some more reach by getting retweeted or whatever shared. Um, and we also get some cool merchandise. I'm wearing my Hugging Face socks today. I, well, it's not easy to show you, but I am wearing my Hugging Face socks. <laughs> so, That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, definitely. I would. I would. Uh, that that was really helpful, and I would totally get um, active on there. Thank you so much. It was a great talk again. Thank you. Okay, uh, Johannes. At least in terms of the questions that were put into chat, I think I've ca I've captured them all uh, in both chat and Q and A. Uh, so, does anyone else? Uh, I know we're at our hour now, uh, but does anyone else have any additional questions at this time uh, for Johannes? Okay. Well, I think we are a wrap, uh, Johannes, for our session today. So this was actually extremely uh, extremely uh, useful today. And uh, I think we already have a couple of calls to have you come back later to perhaps talk about Mamba and uh, Cosmos. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, the, the uh, invitation is open for you to come back at a later time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was also a lot of fun for me, a lot of fun uh, creating the, the presentation. And yeah, I'd be happy to come back. OK, no problem. OK, again, thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, we will put up the uh, slides and the video uh, within about 48 hours or so. So stay tuned uh, for the links uh, for both. So thank you again, everyone, uh, for your time today. Thanks, Johannes. And uh, everyone, have a good rest of your day.